lift your voice and say, you are good. You've been good. You've been so good. How many know that God's been good to you? You are good. We didn't deserve it, but he's still been been good. good.
put your hands together and give our God the praise. Open up your mouth this morning and lift your voice to heaven. Lift your voice to heaven. Lift your voice to heaven and say hallelujah. something happens until your body begins to be healed until your mind begins to be regulated until God fix your broken heart say hallelujah say hallelujah till your finances come in line hey say hallelujah we'll still give you glory we'll still give you honor Tell them to me. Now give him praise like you know he's been good. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for those who are still on their way. We watch over and protect them, Father, in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for those who, as they used to say, press their way. This morning to be gathered in this place. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for how you have already breathed on us. We pray now, Father, in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, continue in this place. Stir gifts, tear down strongholds, heal minds and hearts by the power of your word and according to your will. Pray now, God, that you would preach, that you would teach, that you would declare your word to us that we may forever be changed. Let this be a life-changing, life-altering moment with you. And we glorify you now for what you're going to continue to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Turn around, hook somebody before you take your seat. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. How many of y'all? Oh, it's a lot of y'all. I ain't expect all y'all to be here. Look at Jesus. Um, amen. To those of y'all watching online, God bless you. 
Uh, we're praying for uh, Eli, and uh, we're praying for Casey. Both of them are sick. Uh, we thank God for all of y'all that drove in the rain. Oh, I'm so proud of y'all. Look at y'all. I, was told, I told Mara, Pastor Mara, it's going to be like six of us in here today. <laughs> Look at y'all. Y'all say for real. Uh, let me ask y'all this before we get into it. How many of you were here last week? Last week, raise your hand. Okay. Put your hands down. How many of you uh, were prayed for for healing or deliverance? Raise your hand. Last week, you were prayed for for healing. Keep your hands up. Keep them up. Keep them up. Keep them up. All right. Of those of you with your hands raised, how many of you have experienced a God change from last Sunday to this Sunday? Raise them. Stand. 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 Amen. Y'all can do better than that. He's one week. God did something one week. All right, y'all sit down, sit down, sit down. How many of you all were prayed for last week for healing or deliverance or something, and you've not yet experienced that change? Raise your hand. You've not yet experienced one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, right after we finish, you... Those of y'all just raise your hands. Uh, meet me down here after service is over. All right. Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Um, all right. Y'all got it? All right. It says, it is right for me to feel this way about you because you have me in your heart as I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the good news, all of you share uh, in his grace with me. And we've been talking about those of y'all that are here for the first time or you haven't been for a second. We're going through the book of Philippians verse by verse. Uh, and we're going through uh, seeing what the Lord has to say about this letter Paul wrote to the church at Philippi. And I have said this before, those of y'all that's new, hear it again. Uh, it is one of his most gracious letters. It is one of his most kind letters. He's thanking them for their partnership. He's thanking them for being with him through the things he's gone through in ministry and in life. And so in these first chunk of verses, it is really Paul greeting them in his letter. So it's like if you uh, write a letter or email to somebody and you start out, hey, how you doing? I hope all is well. Da, da, da. It's kind of your greeting before you get to your points. And so we are still in his greeting. But within that greeting, uh, there is context that to be understood. Y'all with me so far? Uh, what is, if, 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 um, if, uh, do, 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 if I write a letter to someone and I'm referencing Michael Jordan and the Bulls just winning their fourth championship, right? If you're reading that way in the future, that gives you an idea of the time that is happening around the life of the writer. That makes sense? That makes sense? All right. Uh, so people have an idea. Oh, let me see when Jordan won the fourth championship um, because Jordan is the greatest to ever play the game. <laughs> better than Kobe. <laughs> better, better than LeBron. Um, better than LeBaby. Uh, so you look and say, let me see when this was, when the greatest to ever play the game won his fourth. Um, and it gives you an idea. Now, this, this becomes a broader question. You want to begin to ask, what else is happening in the world and in the space of the writer during the time of Jordan's fourth championship? This gives you a better idea of what the writer is saying and what they are not saying. When they make references to things, you have a better idea of those references because you have an idea of the context. Y'all with me so far? All right. Remember the ground rule. You can't, can't take, only, you can only take out the refrigerator what's in there. Can't put nothing in there. Those of y'all that's like, what that mean? What a refrigerator? <laughs> We're talking about the Bible. Uh, you cannot put, well, you should not, we should not put things in the scripture that are not already there. That is what the big word people call eisegesis. And what we want to do is exegete the scripture and pull out of, all right? 
So we've been on verse 7, not because Paul is saying anything super elaborate or deep. We've been on verse 7 to provide a greater sense of context of the time in which Paul is writing that will inform how we read the rest of the book. Y'all with me so far? All right. Uh, So we talked about having someone partner with us in imprisonment, partner with us in the defense of the gospel, and partner with us in the confirmation of the gospel. When looking at the defense of the gospel, uh, we shared, well, tried last week, but the week before that, we started dealing with the fact that the gospel was facing an attack or an onslaught uh, in two spaces. The first one was the government. I'll write that down. The government or politics. The second one was religion. Religion. So the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is fresh and new at this particular time, is facing an onslaught of resistance from the political realm and the religious realm. In regards to the political realm, at that time, y'all, Rome uh, was the epicenter of the empire. It was the, it was the main spot. It was the melting pot of cultures and religions. Uh, but many Roman authorities were often very, very suspicious of new, what they felt, uprisings, right? And Jesus has stirred the pot. Jesus has stirred the pot. Jesus has died. He has now risen. And you got a bunch of people from the government's perspective, a bunch of lunatics running around talking about this dead dude that got up, and they believe it. One of the most powerful things that exist in the world is belief. It it can transform your life for the good or for the bad. Uh, All of us, especially anybody here over 20, (laughs) uh, has probably learned a hard lesson about belief. Because you and I have believed in some folk that you found out probably shouldn't have believed in. And then there are others that we did not believe in that we look back and say, I probably should have believed. Uh, Belief, you all, will drive you and I to do stuff we would not normally do. Once a person is convinced of something, It is almost impossible to unconvince us because, in a way, that belief becomes a God. Process that for a second. You can believe so much so that your daddy would never do X, Y, and Z. That even while watching him do X, Y, and Z, you will say to yourself, I must not be seeing this. All right, let's go, let's go. Uh, anybody ever been in a relationship? You ever dated before? Anybody, anybody? Raise your hand. Don't be sad. Don't be ashamed. It's all right. Y'all got trauma over dating. We got to pray about that. It's February. He's supposed to be. <laughs> uh, you, 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 you ever been so, let's go two ways. Let's go, let's go the negative way first. You ever been so sure that joker was cheating? That ain't no way in the world that wasn't him over there at Walmart with that girl? You followed them around Walmart for 30 minutes, stand one aisle behind. (laughs) Only to get to the checkout and be like, oh, that ain't him. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you, you haven't been so sure of someone that the people closest to you say, mm-mm, she ain't for you, dog. Y'all haters, y'all, y'all just don't understand our love. Y'all just don't understand how she loves me. She understands me like y'all don't understand me. She don't like you, bro. No, you a hater. You just want to be with her for yourself. Two years later, <laughs> Belief can make us do stuff 
we would not normally do. And the government, the politics at this time are fearful, concerned because what do you do with a group of people that believed a dead man got up? What is the capacity of this group to believe that a guy that we killed is alive? A guy, watch this. The issue is not if his body is alive. The issue is him being alive means what he preached is alive. Y'all with me so far? Stay with me. If we don't serve a risen Savior, then the words in the Bible are of none effect. Paul said, if Jesus be not risen from the grave, then we are still in our sins. If he's gotten up, then that means I can get up from anything that holds me down if I abide in him, watch this, who's gotten up. But if he be not risen, then there is nothing that has pulled me out of death. And the truth of the matter is, watch this, the, the one that proclaims the message is not themselves the message. Uh, which means you cannot find salvation in Daryl. You cannot find salvation in T.D. Jakes. You can't find salvation in Joel Osteen. You can't find salvation in the church you attend or in grandma's song or in granddaddy's prayers. You have to find it in your relationship with the risen Savior for yourself. That's why we got to be careful not to exalt our pastors, our politicians, our celebrities, and our churches above our God. We are but proclaimers of the one that has risen, but every last one of us in this room and watching online have to know him for yourself. Because if you can believe in him, Anything is possible. And the government had concern about this. They pushed back on this. They, they, they were suspicious of this because Christianity was challenging the existing social order. And it challenged the emperor's authority. If our church... Uh, does not challenge the existing social order of the space we are in, we are not a church connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, and Paul, let me say that. If, uh, do -do, I got to think how to say this because some of y'all might get too excited about this. Uh, I'm going to say it like this. If our Christ following it's not offensive to culture. We are probably not following Christ. Now, some of y'all, some of y'all shouting, but it's, it's gonna come back. This boomerang gonna come back and hit you in a second. So, because this idea that the church should be relevant is one I wrestle with. And I want y'all to wrestle with me. And those y'all watching online, wrestle with me. Wrestle with me. Um, that's if you at home because you sick or you stuck in your house. Um, if you are cooking breakfast and walking around, then I'm about to talk about you. Um, <laughs> relevance is not what we're called to be. How can you be relevant and revolutionary? Now, that does not mean for y'all super safe folk that we come out from among them and be ye separate. That's not what that 
exactly means. It doesn't mean we shun sinners. It doesn't mean we look down on people. It doesn't mean we treat people with a disdain because they are not where we are. And that's one of the major issues in the church today is that we have this weird tendency to look down on folk that do not look how we think they should look when they come to church. But it's interesting because what if we saw everybody like God saw everybody because many of us in here that are clothed in the nicest things in God's eyes we are naked and looking like hobos and some people that come in the church without a name brand on and clothes that they have borrowed from somebody just to be in the building God looks at them and sees glory resting on them we have to be careful not to get into a space where we are judgmental we are asking God to grow the church but who do you think God's going to send to grow his church. We have a misconception in America. We want to be relevant because we want to draw a certain type of person. And so that's why all of our churches look the same. That's why all of our churches sound the same. That's why all of our churches preach the same, declare the same, and do the same because we are shuffling churchy people between churches. But God says, I sent you to be fishers of men and not have a group of fishers fishermen just hanging out together and that is what the church has been called to do so what are you saying pastor I'm saying how dare fish look down on fish we ain't been fishermen that long to have a disdain for the young woman that comes in dressed inappropriately, you used to dress like that when? And it wasn't Jesus that changed you. Your body just ch- I just don't know about these young girls. Opposite work, young. Because if you still could... Some of y'all still do. And I, <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be like, Pastor Margo, can you go talk to Sister So? So, because the Lord has enlarged their territory and they don't know. And for the ladies thing, I ain't picking on the ladies. Brothers, too. Brothers, too. Brothers, too. We in our third trimester trying to wear fitted shirts. Just. That six-pack gone, brother. It's, it's a keg. It's a keg there. Let it go. <laughs> Elsa said, let it go. Let it go. Trying to be sexy. All these sexy preachers. Where these sexy preachers come from? Swollen, all, uh, skinny jeans. What are we trying to draw? The government is no longer worried about the church today. Because the church is not revolutionary today. Let me keep going. They are concerned. And in contemporary America, y'all, there is a noticeable trend where one part of our country resists the principles of the Bible, while another part manipulates the Bible for its own purposes. It is important, church, that you study the Word. I love y'all. Most of y'all love me. (laughs) Watch this. But I'm going to tell you, As much as I love God, as much as a burden sits on me to do the best I can before you and with you, I have to constantly acknowledge you don't belong to me. Hold on, listen. Every pastor someplace that is called by God should acknowledge the fact that no matter how much studying we do, how much fasting, how much praying we do, how much yielding to the Holy Spirit we do, 
everything we declare and preach to you still has to come through us. And there's still going to be parts of us that may view things a certain way, be biased about certain things. You, therefore, have to study for yourself. Take what God gives you through the woman of God, through the man of God. Go home and dissect that thing. Holy Spirit, what are you telling me? What are you saying to me? What do you, what, what do you want me to know from what the man and the woman of God has presented? And you, and you break that down because watch this. If you lean solely on what you have heard preached, your gospel is full of that preacher. Y'all with me? So, that means, watch this, <laughs> many of us, us, have not yet fully become because there are parts of us that are still our first pastor. There are parts of us that are still grandma's theology. There are parts of us that are still the overheard prayers of our mother. Um, I don't know how we got here, but let me stay here for a hot second. That is why it is critical for you and I to have an individual personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, God, the Father. Because the Holy Spirit will continue to shift and change you and I. Now watch this, and there is a language. Uh, how can I? Um, anybody? Anybody? Oh, how can I put this? Help me, Holy Spirit. Uh, okay, I got it. Me and my friends from Chicago. There's conversations we can have in front of all y'all, and you have no clue what we're talking about. Whole Same words. You understand. You know what the word is. But you don't know what it means. You don't know what the context. Though you're going to go down the low end. We'll stay away from following them. The mo over there going to pop you. What? Who is Mo? Does he have pop and soda? Does he sell soda? Pop? You, you know. Watch this. My point to you is this. When you have lived, reoccurring, consistent relationship with the Holy Spirit, there will be a language that will exist between you and the Holy Spirit that other folk won't understand. Uh, now watch this. What happens if you and I spend most of our relationship with God mimicking other people. Then there becomes Matt a prayer that only Matt can pray with God, that God responds to, that never gets prayed because Matt is not praying as Matt with God. He's praying as Matt according to how his dad prayed. Uh, let me give you a quick scripture and we got to keep moving. Uh, I'll give you an example. God answers prayer throughout Scripture, not based specifically on what is asked, but who's asking. And he's basing it on who's asking, princess, based upon how deep the relationship is with them, Natasha. He's, he says when he's about to do some stuff, he says, how can I withhold a secret from my friend? I have to share what I'm about to do with him because we close like that. 
I ain't sharing it with nobody else, but I got to tell Abraham what I'm about to do. I got to let him in on this secret because we share secrets with each other. Ooh, some of y'all catch that in a second. God shares secrets with those that share secrets with him. When you have a language and a communication with God, God will say, I cannot help but to tell you what's going to happen in May because I can't let this blindside my friend. There has to be a careful concern for how we manipulate Scripture based upon what we want. Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't, just keep looking straight ahead if it's you. If you ever search the Bible for permission for something you wanted to do, I know it's a verse in here. I know. I know. Don't, don't he say something about cussing out your enemy somewhere? And then somebody smite, smoke somebody? I, I swear it's in here. Uh, you, you just, I'm going to find it. And you do, anybody ever do the drop the Bible test? I'm just going to drop it and see what word pop up. Oh, that's what he say. Here's what he say. Weapons. I see the word. Weapons. Uh, uh. Praying till you get God to agree with your flesh is manipulation. Twisting the scripture to control somebody else's behavior is manipulation. Uh, all, all these folks today, everybody's so big on mental health. Everybody's so big on psychiatry and all that stuff and, and, and emotional safety. That's manipulation. If you and I try to use the Bible to force someone else's will, let me give you all Pentecostal folk, that's witchcraft. Witchcraft is a sin of control. To try and control another is in psychology, manipulation, and in the spirit is witchcraft. And there is going to be a special judgment, I believe, that God's going to rest on his church. For every pastor, every preacher, every apostle, every prophet, every worship leader, every trustee, every deacon, every board member that has used the word to manipulate people into doing what they want done. And congregations ain't exempt. Because we have taken on the political identity of our nation and we have found it okay to manipulate and control leaders to do what makes us feel good as a group. I said, Pastor, I don't like, we don't, we don't, we've never engaged in such, in such behavior. Let me tell y'all something real quick and I'm going to get off my soapbox and we're going to keep moving because uh, I didn't even realize I stood up on a soapbox. But I feel like I'm a little taller right now, so clearly I'm on one. So I'm going to bring myself back down in a hot second. Uh, but since I've been here in Sacramento, there have been people at this church that have said, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to stop giving. Bye. Don't be proud. Don't be proud. Because about a week after that, when that money didn't come, I'm <laughs> Hey, what, 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 what was that you wanted me to do again? <laughs> it is important, church, to remain vigilant and not lower our guard when someone cites scriptures, Jesus, and especially the Holy Spirit. Um, it is especially dangerous when we invoke the name of the Holy Spirit because crazy folk have realized that's the one name you can't argue with. 
uh, you, you pull out a Bible and say, this is what this means. Everybody can dig in and look up the history of the word and look up where the word came and the context. And I'll say, no, that's, nope, you wrong. But if you say, the God told me. Well, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? God said you my wife. <laughs> Why don't you just ask her out like a regular brother? <laughs> just, <laughs> hey, you cute. Can we go eat? Like just something simple. You just got to put God in it so she can't say nothing. Often, y'all, we live in a culture, hear this, that has co-opted the scriptures to endorse a wide range of politically motivated beliefs. Such actions do not truly defend the gospel. Instead, they exploit it to justify various ideologies. In reality, y'all, many are not defending the gospel, but their gospel. Oh, I'm going to step on some toes, but y'all will be all right. How do you hold to abortion, but not caring for the poor? How are we saying what one person can and cannot do with they stuff? Now, let me argue this for a second because I know, I know it's a strong topic for many people. But let me give you this thing to consider. If God gives free will, Let me say that again for some of y'all still pondering, like, what's the rest of it? If God gives free will, some would argue, well, we are the guardians of the gospel. We are defending the gospel, and we should be able to demand that. That's cool if you did it all around. But to pick and choose where you want to defend the gospel says you are not defending the gospel. You are defending your belief system and what somebody else should and should not do. Manipulation, witchcraft. True essence of the gospel of Jesus Christ lies in a message of unconditional love. Comma. Coupled with boundaries that are defined by the relationship. God himself don't even give us just a run. You can do what you want to do, says God. But if you with me. I remember. <laughs> I remember one time. Brother, some of y'all will identify. Actually, probably anybody that's ever been in more than one relationship will identify this. You ever told your current person about something you were able to do with your last person? Only men? Is that only a man thing? Is that <laughs> if you've never done that, let me give you a warning. Don't, don't, don't. Young fellas here, young ladies, don't, 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 don't. Do not say, well, in my last so-and-so, this wasn't a problem. I saw the heavens open. <laughs> the, the clouds parted. And there was a flash of light. And I thought Jesus was coming back, but no, she had thrown a fork at me. If it wasn't for my superhero-like reflexes, I might be missing an ear right now. Because your previous ain't got nothing to do with me. Every relationship, 
let's think about this for a hot second for love month, comes with its own set of boundaries. <laughs> Just because you could do it with them, don't mean you can do it. Yeah. And you ain't got to do it. But if you want to be with me, you go. Let me say something, I'll unmarried folk, real quick. Stop settling for what you really don't want or need to not be by yourself. It's some folk in here that's been married a long time that can tell you. If I could go back, married people keep looking straight ahead. Don't turn your head. Don't, don't blink. You are just a hostage. Just, mm, mm. But if they could do it over again, they would tell you I would have waited until God said it was time because now I've had to conform myself to fit into this person's ideal of what they want in a mate. And it ain't even me. Some of y'all are witness protection and don't even know it. Yeah, let me keep going. So the relationship, hear this, with Jesus comes with expected boundaries that Jesus establishes with his children. But you still got the choice to decide. I know, it's heavy. It's raining, though, so it ain't sunny out. It ain't like I'm messing up your sunshine. <laughs> I'm just sticking with the weather. But watch this. The boundaries of this relationship. Hear this, and those who can write, write this down. The boundaries of the relationship with Christ are not meant to shift with changing cultural norms. The boundaries of the relationship with Christ do not change with cultural norms. Uh, let's give you a simple one. That was the last one was kind of heavy. Let's give you a simple one. Drums. Everybody say drums. 50 years ago, drums in church was the, de the devil. 50 years ago, drums in church was the devil. Culture changed. Drums in the church. Now, do we trip on it? Do we, oh, no, no, because it's, it's drums. But let's shift for a second, because the other thing that came against Christianity at the time was religion or religious beliefs. There are some changing cultural norms that cannot be brought into the relationship with Christ. Um, I have learned to think before I speak. <laughs> uh, Margo, remind me later to tell you what I just thought about. Uh, and if Margo say it's cool, I'll tell y'all next week what I was thinking. But watch this. It's one thing to bring the drums in. Because the drums take nothing from the relationship. The drums take nothing from the interaction. They enhance. They add to the worship atmosphere and all that stuff. But you cannot then bring in sage. You cannot then bring in dream catchers. I know. <laughs> Y'all be okay. Loosen up. Loosen up. Shake your shoulders. Because, watch this, these things are rooted and tied to religious belief systems of other cultures who use them in communication with other gods. So you cannot then introduce into the house of God things that pull in other gods. Y'all with me so far? 
All right. The religious push against Jesus at that time was not just uh, pagan beliefs or other gods, so to speak, little gods, little G's, uh, but also the Jewish people had issue with what was happening at that time. So now imagine, this is the crazy part. These are God's people. This is who he came for. <laughs> His church was not filling him. Sad note, church folk always been church folk. That is not an actual reason to not be a part of the church. Because church people have always been church people. Watch this, even towards God. Religion pushes back against it. Religion begins to push back against Christianity. We have to be careful, y'all, in this day and age that we do not get so relevant that we are engaging in religious spirits or demonic activities. No Christian, oh, and I know, I know somebody watching this, and I know some of my strong, strong militant brothers and sisters, we'd have these arguments. But there's no way any believer in Jesus Christ possessed by the Holy Spirit should be burning sage in their house to ward off evil spirits. No, that's what the Holy Ghost is for. When a dream catcher is supposed to catch bad dreams, that's what the Holy Ghost is for. But we want stuff that requires nothing of us that we can control in our hand. But when it comes to God, God demands something of us in return. And we don't want to submit to his demands. So we go and find a little God we can wave around. We go and find what we can control for ourselves. That's why some of us got with the people we got with. You didn't pick because they were worthy, you picked them because you could control them. That's how some of us pick churches. You go where you can cause the most havoc and have the most authority and upset the system according to what you want. And when you find a church that does not let that happen, you leave. It's called witchcraft, Jezebel. You cannot control the house of God with your money. You cannot control the house of God with your sexuality. You can't control the house of God with your political influence. God has to be the God of his church. And at some point, the church got to stop pimping herself out to the highest bidder. If we got to stay in this CRC building for the rest of our existence, so be it before we sell our soul to get us something big. We done lost our minds. Stop lowering your standard to move an inch forward. At the end of the day, they are pushing back against Jesus. But they don't understand, princess. They're fine to us, a child is born. A son is given, and the government whew, rests on his shoulders. Let me pause there for a hot second so y'all can understand something real quick. Y'all don't mind if I preach and we go home? Can we preach and go home? Uh, let's pretend like we're a Pentecostal church down in the south somewhere. Just uh, The government sits on his shoulders. He don't sit on the government's shoulders. They can't remove prayer from schools if you put praying kids in schools. Uh, 
they, they can't, school shooters will stop when the people of God stand up and begin to lay hands on builders and call on the glory of God to cover our kids. Roger, let me back up for a hot second. And you start raising kids in a way in the fear and the admonition of God. Spare the rod, spoil the child. We got to get to the place where we begin to declare to our kids that God is God. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Watch this. And I'm your pappy. Do anything against what I say and Remember, we down in the backwoods somewhere. We down in the backwoods. Y'all ain't highfalutin. Y'all ain't evolved. You, you ain't reached a new stratosphere. We got to get to the place where we understand your vote may matter in the earth, but your prayers matter in the spirit. And then when we begin to pray, it don't matter who's in public office. God still sits on the throne. Get rid of your anxiety about the next election. I don't care who wins it. Let me tell you why. Because I know a God that still reigns. Uh, he lives. He lives. He lives today. And there is no government. Iran, Russia, U.S., China, North Korea, South Korea that can overthrow my God. We have lost our minds. You got all this anxiety. Oh, is Trump going to win or is Biden going to win? The government rests on his shoulders. Some of y'all going to catch that. <laughs> yeah, I, saw, I saw one time. Walking outside, a father and family walking. And I thought it was two, two adults and two teenagers. And I said, oh, look at that. They only got two kids. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Yeah. You know, just, you know, how my mind works sometimes. And uh, for a second, the dad disappeared. Couldn't say, oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Dad disappeared. I couldn't see him in the picture no more. It was just mama and the two teens. I'm like, where did dad go? Now, I do this because our people watch. Anybody else people watch? Okay, just, not just me. <laughs> the rest of y'all weird, too. All right, sorry. Because I know some of y'all like, how you see the dad disappear? What, what would you do? I was just watching. I was watching. Dad disappears. I'm like, oh, where did dad go? You know, maybe he went to get some food or something. Maybe he just seemed interesting. A few seconds later, dad pops back up. But there's a kid that is above all of them because he didn't put the kid on his shoulders. And I said, I didn't even know y'all had. <laughs> Another kid, this is what I'm saying to myself, like I know them, like, like we cool like that. I'm like, I didn't even know. Y'all had another kid. When did y'all get the other kid? That's kind of nice. Oh, he cute. All right, cute little kid. The kid's up there far, they walking for a little bit, and walking for a little bit. Dad disappears again. I said, oh, where he go now? <laughs> he must have been tired of carrying that kid. Put the kid down. Two seconds later, I look up. He's back. But there's another kid on his shoulder. Little girl. I said, they got two more kids. And I notice <laughs> every time, oh, Holy Spirit, let y'all get this. Every time dad disappeared, there was a change in who was exalted. Every time, watch this, let me, let me change the word, because I have to realize, thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit said, Dad never disappeared. Every time I could not see the Father from my vantage, when he came back, there was a change in who he had lifted up. Woo I came to tell somebody, don't you get anxious when it seems like you can't see the Father operating in the nation. It just means he's ducked down to exalt a change. Uh, he's gone down to lift something else up. But watch this. It don't matter what he lifts up because he's still father. And it can't be exalted unless father lifts. See? And he has a tendency to pull leadership from the places we can't see. This ain't got nothing to do with verse 7. Uh, 
Father, this is why it's taking so long. This ain't got nothing to do with verse 7. But I believe it's to encourage somebody. Because nobody saw David. You going down the list of senators and you going down the list of presidential possibilities, all the ones you see. God has a way of finding random greatness in fields. Where do you think we came from? I would venture to bet money one now. None of us in this room and those watching online, the ones that are sick and shut and couldn't actually get outside, not the ones that are walking around the kitchen right now living life. Weren't expected to amount to much. Weren't expected to live. Weren't expected to ever be in any church. Let alone so much so that you came outside on a rainy storm day. Weren't expected to make it to this point. But by the grace of God, And your insane belief that a dude that was killed got up. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed, just for a second. Meditate on whatever the Lord is saying to you, what he's speaking to you. While heads bowed and eyes are closed, I would ask you to consider this between you and the Lord. Some of us may have to repent to God for trying to control other people, trying to control God. We may have to repent for manipulating his scriptures. We may have to repent for using other things that connect to other gods in our lives. Leaning on luck, leaning on the universe. He says, I am the God of all flesh. There are no other gods beside me. Beside me, there is no other. Some of us may need to repent for trying to be safe Christians. We, we try so hard to get everybody to like us that we've never thought we may be called to agitate people to Jesus. But some of us in this space may also have to repent for being intentional, unyielded agitators. For intentionally stirring pots, hoping for chaos. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. God, we glorify you. We thank you. For all that you are doing in this space, we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to the hearts of these, your sons and daughters. That if anyone here doesn't know you in a personal relationship with you, that right now you would draw them unto yourself. Lord, we know none of us are perfect. We know that we have all fallen short. But we know when we call on you as Savior and Lord, your love, your grace, your love, it covers a multitude of sin. So God, we are not praying for perfect people, but that we would be yielded people pursuing you. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. This won't take long. I'm not going to embarrass you. 
I'm just going to ask you a quick question. If you're here and you were to die, if you were to die tonight, you're not 100% sure that you would spend eternity with the Lord. But you want to be sure. It's not about church attendance. A whole lot of people go to church and don't know Jesus. A whole lot of people lead in church and don't know Jesus. The question is, do you know for certain you have a personal relationship with God to the point that it is shown in your life changing? If you're not sure, but you want to be sure, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, just slip your hand up. Nobody's looking but me. Just slip your hand up. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you. You may lower your hands. Those of you just raised your hand, this is what's going to happen next. I want you to prepare yourself for it. I'm not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make you give a speech. I'm going to ask you to repeat a prayer out loud after me. After I ask you to repeat that prayer, I'm going to count to three. Then I'm going to ask you to walk down to where I am. You're not going to speak. You ain't got to do nothing. We're just going to celebrate you, pray for you, and get some information from you. Uh, don't hesitate. Don't let fear lock you up. Don't be like, oh, man, I don't want to do all that. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. The Bible also encourages us that in the last days that we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That means having a church home. That means having a place where you say, this is my church. This is where I am. I'm growing with the people in this place to be who God wants me to be. So when I count to three, that's what you're going to come for. If you accepted Christ, if you prayed that prayer, I want you to come. If you want to if you want to be a part of this church, when I count to three, you're going to come. But first, those that raise their hands to accept Christ, I want you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Say this, dear Jesus, I confess my sins. Come into my heart and save me. I believe that you died. And you rose just for me. Now, Holy Spirit, I yield to you. Direct my life. In Jesus' name.